What's up, sweaties? It's episode 150 of Collider Heroes. It's a Friday. I'm here with my squad, the full team in effect. We're going to talk about non-superhero film adaptations. With me, we got Robert Meyer Burnett. It's good to be back. You know, I've been wondering uh, what kind of fire an undead... Oh, never mind. Um, never mind. It's just good to be back. <laughs> Amy Dallin. Robert Vampire Hunter. Uh, hello, good to be back. 150? Yeah. Oh my God. It's pretty crazy. I mean, ever since we went daily, we're just running through these numbers now. We're going to be at episode, the pulse pounding 200th episode is right around that corner. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, we're also going to be, uh, you know, get your tickets now at New York Comic Con. We're all going to be there doing a panel, Collider Heroes. We're going to be hanging out. So if you're in the New York area, get your New York Comic Con tasty tickets and hang out with the heroes. We're going to be doing a lot of stuff there with Collider and whatnot. Um, definitely this Tuesday, August 29th, let's have, get that tasty graphic back up where Perry Nemiroff is getting her head almost <laughs> chewed off by a Tyrannosaurus Rex. <laughs> There's a bunch of other goons on that in that car. None of us are featured in there, but we're gonna probably be there hanging out, getting some drinks after we see Jurassic Park on the big screen. It's August 29th. That's a Tuesday, 7:30 p.m. Come hang out with us at the Arc Light Cinemas in Hollywood to watch a movie that you've probably seen a million times, but you've never seen it with us. We're gonna be yelling throughout the no, we're not gonna be talking to the movie, <laughs> but uh, we're gonna probably be there afterwards. So hang out with us. Uh, definitely this episode we're going to get into non-superhero movies and there's a ton of them let's get into some of the honorable mentions right off the bat we've got 300 we've got red road to redemption weird science creep show scott pilgrim versus the world a history of violence and persepolis all in there as honorable mentions i mean creep show some could argue was never a comic book it was like based on tales from the crypt but then they made a special edition comic that bernie writes and drew which was an adaptation of the Stephen King, George Romero screenplay. So technically it is a comic book, honorable mention type thing. A lot of these history of violence, a lot of people don't think about history of violence or road to perdition as a comic book. Atomic Blonde would be in there. Amy, you got one that you just mentioned that I was like, man, I don't know. What, what's the one that you just mentioned? Oh, I was just curious where, where Hellboy fits in to our like superhero, non-superhero divide. So for me, it's a really, that's a, it's a great question. I didn't include Hellboy in the non-superhero because i see hellboy very as a superhero comic book but you're dead right it really <laughs> isn't a superhero comic it should be in this list so like the fun of today's topic is just to remember like the crazy variety of what's out there like i mean persepolis is one of the the best books ever written yeah. i think like it's just this amazing and it's not like anything else no. um and then one of the honorable mentions here is is probably like my number one just for personal reasons right. scott pilgrim versus the world right uh that was a friggin' amazing movie. Yes. It's it's really difficult. That's what I mean. It's like, this is just like a list of movies. You could rearrange them in whatever order you want. Scott Pilgrim was higher up in my list, and then I found a couple that I had forgotten about and just yeah. pushed it pushed it down out of a top 10. So if I had a top 20, all these movies that we just honorable mentioned would all be in that list. And to be honest with you, the list is a constantly fluctuating thing. It's so easy to be like, God, is Hellboy a superhero? It, I mean, yes and no, the BPRD, are they a superhero team? Yes and no, it's, it's, it's very difficult, it's such a razor's edge. If I had to put Hellboy in, he would be in probably the number three or number four spot. He's not even in this list because I consider it a superhero series, but you're absolutely right, it could be not a superhero series. So these kinds of lists are ultimately just to have fun and talk about these cool movies. Robert, what do you think about these honorable mentions? Well, I, you know, I think it's true. I, I, I you know, Ghost World mm. to me is one of my favorite yeah. comic book adaptations and people forget Ghost World. I'm like, yeah. no, it's, it's a comic book adaptation. Oh baby, Ghost World's in this list. Baby. Yeah, I know, no. I know. And, so, and, and I, I just think a lot of people really forget like yes. Road to Perdition. They don't think of it as a, I mean, that was Sam Mendes. It was it was Tom Hanks. I mean, the pedigree of that film right. is like an A-list Oscar contender. Well, you mentioned uh, Ghost World. There's a lot of other Daniel Klaus films that aren't in my list because they just weren't good adaptations. <laughs> I mean, there's his comics are fantastic. I'm right. still waiting for a like a Velvet Glove cast and iron movie or Netflix series. That is such an incredible surreal story that it's made to be. I feel it would be a, an incredible series. That's TV Twin Peaks. just gonna be like, why is this happening? And we're just gonna be like, shh, that's the point. Or movies exactly. like Crumb. <laughs> you know, Crumb isn't yes. really an adaptation, but it's about a comic book artist. Crumb is a, a comic book incredible creator documentary yeah it's just like literally mind-blowing absolutely yeah. and that's not a fictional movie but it's 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 still to me one of the great 
one of the great movies about comics. Oh my god! In a way, it really is. I mean, and when you when you find out about Robert Crumb's brothers, just watch the movie Crumb. Yeah. I mean, it's like you got to watch that. Let's get into our list. Top ten uh, non superhero movies. Uh, let's go right into The Mask. So it was released in 1994, $351 million at the box office. It was the feature film debut of Cameron Diaz. Jim Carrey was nominated for a Golden Globe and a Razzie as Worst New Star, which is unfair. I thought he was fantastic in this. Film lost to Forrest Gump at the Oscars for Best Visual Effects. Now, this movie really, 1994, CG graphics were just coming into flavor. Some of those scenes where he's like, got all the guns. Like Some of these incredible sequences that are in The Mask really kind of highlighted what you could do in the world of CG, and it helped because The Mask was very cartoony, so that really lent itself to having these weird cartoony effects. I remember seeing The Mask and loving it. It's definitely not a superhero movie, but it was a comic book first. What are your thoughts, Amy? We'll start with you, The Mask. I mean, I, I have super fond memories of this one. This is the sort of like, all right, this is, this is why Jim Carrey was put on the earth, like to do some of his cool, more serious performances, yeah. and then also to do this. Like, it's, it's classic clown stuff. Yes. Like, it's, it's, a, it's a, a fantastic performance. I didn't even realize this was Cameron Diaz's first movie. Yeah. Oh, my God crazy Robert oh you know I like this movie too I I'm not a huge fan of Jim Carrey's over the top like Ace Ventura I know people love that stuff I'm more of a character base this is more like I don't know something like Harold Lloyd or some mm. Charlie Chaplin back in the day but yeah. done as a modern insane I'm on crack clown like you said um but it's it's it was so much fun and so fantastic to watch and 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 Jim Carrey if you like him or not he was incredible in this role and it was it's, I don't know if it's a great adaptation of this source material. It's different. It's, it's definitely different, different. But it's it's a lot of fun. Hey, it's no Son of the Mask. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not on the list either. You know, I'm a big Jim Carrey fan. Smoking. I just, I love Jim Carrey. I love Jerry Lewis. I love the clowns. Right. And I love, I love Dumb and Dumber. I could watch that anytime, and I will still laugh every time they're doing the ketchup and mustard scene or the screaming, hey, you want to hear an irritating sound? And just like stuff like that just makes me cry laughing. So, cause I'm an idiot. Um, but you know what? <laughs> Let's go to number nine. It's MIB, Mint in Box. No, Men in Black. It's released in 1997. It made $589 million at the box office. That's right, Rotten Tomatoes wasn't around back then, but 92% of Rotten Tomatoes, it's still in there. It won an Academy Award for Best Makeup. Uh, Frank the Pug is voiced by puppeteer Tim Blaney. There's a little uh, flavor for you, Johnny Five from Short Circuit. What are your thoughts about Men in Black, Amy? Again, this is another, like, I've never read the comics this is based on, and right. I didn't even know this was based on a comic for many years. But, like, it's just like a nearly perfect comedy sci-fi film. Like, I, 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 the, this list actually isn't by, like, I need to sit down and rewatch Men in Black. It was just fun. Yeah, Men in Black really was. It was an unexpected thing. Even as a comic nerd, I was like, nah, I didn't pick up that because it was it was an outsider published company. Uh, they picked up the rights and just went right in. I think it was Platinum. I can't even remember what the comic company was called. But I remember hearing about, oh, Men in Black, that sounds kind of cool. Is it one of like x files is it? And you're like, no, it's a comedy. It's a really fun, big science fiction comedy series. Robert? Well, you just mentioned X-Files. I think this was, if X-Files wasn't successful, it was, a, you're talking 97, X-Files was huge. Huge mm. by season four. It started in 93, and then this was sort of the answer to that. Right. Mm. But I love this idea that let's just embrace the aliens. The fact that there's a group that knows aliens have been here, we're part of this whole galactic system, and it, it, I love this film. I, you know, I don't like the sequels as much, right. but it was exactly what I wanted to see. I wanted to believe that this organization existed. I wanted to believe that there was some kind of low-life, low-level aliens that you know are like informants, like right. you'd see in a, in a cop thriller. Like there's Serpico, and then there's Serpico, but aliens know who Serpico yeah. is. You know, and I thought this was great. And the old idea of the Men in Black thing was all the way back to the 50s and mm -hmm. the Majestic Project, Blue Book, all that stuff was great. Yeah. Great it, team it, up, too. And a great uh, cast, by yeah. the way. Yeah, it had real heart to it and, and, like, really fun performances. And then, like, the, the basic concept of this movie, like, the training sequence, yeah. uh, like, stands as this perfect, like, proof of concept of, like, yeah, this movie was just taking that, like, okay, but what would the realistic version of this look like? And, and had the most fun with it. Totally. And, and the makeup, too. I love the fact that all the aliens are not realistic. You know, they're these crazy, like you'd see great art in a comic that mm -hmm. would be drawn. I mean, and they went, they really embraced it, and it was tough to, it's tough to sort of toe that tonal line, but they did yeah, it Yeah, I think really once, well. once we're in the main world where they're like, we've known about aliens for years, and they're like, Michael Jackson's an alien. And they're like <laughs> doing all these reveals. I mean, it had a great sense of humor. If you've never saw Men in Black, do yourself a favor and watch Men in Black. Number eight, we've got Fritz the Cat. 
That's right, it was released in 1971. $850,000 budget has made over $90 million. It was based on Fritz the Cat by Robert Crumb. Uh, it was, this is directed by Ralph Bakshi. Crumb was dissatisfied with the film, calling it one of the, the, those experiences I sort of block out. But Crumb, there's no reason to be bitter. It's a fun film. Uh, I think Bakshi did a great job. Ralph Bakshi, an amazing director, and he's done so many amazing adult cartoons, starting with Fritz the Cat. If you've never seen Fritz the Cat, Check it out. Check out his other films, American Pop. There's so many. Ralph Bakshi is the king of adult cartoons. And uh, so yeah, what are your thoughts, Robert, on Fritz the Cat? I have such fondness for this because it was one of the first naughty videotapes I ever had, and I showed it to all my friends. Yes. I mean, it is, it is way inappropriate. You know, I've I've mentioned Omaha the Cat Dancer on the show before. If you don't ever read, if don't read that book if you're a kid. You should not see this movie if you're a kid, which means you should run out and watch it. But it might be dated. I haven't seen this in 25 years. Yo, it's totally dated. And but that's what makes it cool. It's a product of the 70s, yeah. and they just don't make movies like this anymore. Absolutely not. So I mean, if you if you don't even know what we're talking about, Fritz the Cat, Google that, check it out, rent it, see it, Amy. I have not seen this one. I've seen Bakshi's All Ages. There's work, a sequel and too. It's fantastic, uh, but I got to put this one on the list. Yeah, don't put the sequel on the list. Just see Fritz the Cat. That's my <laughs> opinion. But you know what? Let's get right into. You know, hey, got it the sometimes. Nine Lives of Fritz the Cat. Nope. All right. <laughs> American Splendor. That's right. Harvey P. Carr lives. That's right. Released in 2003, 94% of Rotten Tomatoes. It was nominated as a Best Adapted Screenplay at the Academy Awards in 2003. Uh, Spring Berman and Pacini also directed it. This was their uh, first narrative feature based off of uh, the previous directing documentaries. So we had Paul Giamatti playing Harvey P. Carr. I absolutely love this movie. It is such a good film tonally and just goes through this kind of self-hating weird dude who was Harvey Pekar. If you don't know who he was, he used to show up on David Letterman late night and just be like, yeah. Dave, I got problems. He was like a mailman. <laughs> he would self-publish his own comic books. What were the comic books? About his crummy life, being a mailman, hanging out on the bus and hating on stuff. It, American Splendor, the comic book, some, it's done by a bunch of disparate artists. Sometimes it's weird. Sometimes Robert Crumb, because he felt sorry for Harvey Pekar and liked drawing him, he's like, you look weird, drawing Harvey Pekar. <laughs> Literally, this movie captures all of that incredible flavor. Your thoughts about American Splendor? Well, this actually, I, 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 I'm embarrassed that I haven't seen this one, but like when it came out, I hadn't discovered the comics yet, right, uh, right. American Splendor. And, and like, they're so cool and so like fascinating. Uh, so I really gotta go back and catch this one. Yeah, American Splendor is great. And you should never feel embarrassed if you haven't seen a film. Cause guess what? I tell what? other people that, but then I feel embarrassed anyway. But no, like, it, now you get to see it. Yeah. That's why I always be like, now you get to see this movie, Robert. I love this film because it's such a great adaptation of the source material. Mm -hmm. I mean, it so does Harvey P. Card justice. And if you'd seen like you, do that Harvey Picard impression again. That was good. Dave, I, I'm <laughs> yeah, telling I mean, you, I just can't do this mailroom thing anymore, Dave. Yeah. If you'd seen Picard, uh, it, it, they couldn't, it's so well cast. Giamatti, there's no other actor that could have played this role the way right. he played this role. And if you really want to have a joyous afternoon, watch American Splendor and then follow it up with Sideways. Mm. Because get the Giamatti double smash. I like that. Awesome. That's a good double feature. And Giamatti, when you look at what <laughs> Harvey Picard actually looks like, he doesn't look anything. Nothing. 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 Absolutely <laughs> nothing. Like Harvey, and I remember even Harvey Vigar, oh, why'd they get that guy? It's like, well, you're not that good looking either, dude. You're just weirder. You're like like a weird vulture. And like, it's a, just a different kind of weird. So, I mean, Paul Giamatti did a fantastic job. You're absolutely right. Number six is V for Vendetta. So released in 2005, James Purefoy originally was cast as V, but Hugo Weaving stepped in and ended up playing the role when they finished the film. Natalie Portman's cast as Eve. Director James McTeague had been working on Star Wars Episode Two: Attack of the Clones. He also had worked with the uh, Wachowski brothers who were involved in writing the script siblings. version. The Wachowski siblings, thank you. Um, and so the V for Vendetta ad adaptation based off of Alan Moore's work, I think it was a, a pretty fantastic adaptation, even though some of the, some of the ending was changed. I think it's a really, it's not a superhero film in my book. Other people would argue it is a superhero film. So it really is kind of a case by case scenario on people's opinions. I personally feel it was like, you know, this is like a full on, like if you had, a, a you lived in a, a dictatorship and what would terrorism and what would dictatorships and uh, revolutionary actions be held accountable for if you were a vigilante? That's what this is all about. It's some heavy, heavy subjects that are 
that are broached in this movie and it's you know a lot of stuff going on in our real world now makes v for vendetta even more important as a film and a thought process to see what are your thoughts amy well yeah this story doesn't get any less scary with time <laughs> right uh and it like i love that this one really brought attention to the like some of these other stories that like deserved to make the jump to film like look what else there is to offer here so like yeah i, I think it's it's generally considered like this is the best of the Alan Moore adaptations, right? Feels that way to me, yeah. Mm. How about you? I, I feel the same way. I mean, you know, if you, I grew up reading Brave New World and, and 1984, and I love, I thought the comic, when, when it came out, the design of the comic was a little dense. Mm -hmm. Like the artwork was a little, I, I guess I would call it thick. Yep. When I was reading it, you know, and-, and It is, but it's great. It is, it is great. And I love the comic. I read the comic after I'd read Watchmen. I think it came out after Watchmen. I mean. It, it had come out before in England, but when it was republished by DC, it was after. Right. And uh, I think this is, again, it's an incredibly faithful adaptation. It's a beautifully designed film. You know, I didn't know about Guy Fox. you know, remember, remember the 5th of November, the gunpowder, gunpowder treason and plot. Right. I didn't know about that. And so I was, went back and looked at English history and like, wow, this is, this is really cool. Well, I mean, I found out about it because of the comic. V for Vendetta was illustrated by David Lloyd. Mm -hmm. It was written by Alan Moore. Check out the comic book. It's worth reading. And then check out the movie if you haven't seen it. Number five, Dread. Released 2012. It was a financial bomb taking in $41 million off a nearly $45 million budget. Still generally well-received, 78% Rotten Tomatoes. I saw it the last day it was playing in 3D in the theater and then was screaming to all of my friends, go see this movie, it's incredible. I couldn't believe I waited all this time. It really is one of the most fantastic uses of 3D in any of the films I've ever seen because of the slow-mo effect. And anybody who saw it in 3D knows exactly what I'm talking about. It stands up even just as without 3D, as without that little gimmick, it still stands up as a really fun action film. People keep comparing it to The Raid, The Raid, The Raid. It's not The Raid. It's got a storyline that's similar in that everything takes place in the centralized tower and they got to work their way up. But besides that, it is not The Raid. It is a Dread film. We're in Mega City 1. I think Carl Urban is fantastic as Dread, and I'm really thankful to hear that with this TV series possibly happening, he might return as Dread so we get a little continuity in there. What are your guys' thoughts on Dread? Let's start with you, Amy. Yeah, I'm so glad. I, I, I missed this one in theaters. Uh, and I was talking to y'all and one of our spotlights that I went back and caught it and, and was just, just so pleasantly surprised. Like, it was a really fun movie. Like, it's it's memorable in good ways. They they make great use out of the self-contained premise. Um, it's got, like, a, a fantastic villain. Uh, and, yeah, it made me want to see more. Yeah. I, I love this movie so much. I mean, I've always loved the character of Dread, and I thought the 95 film was completely over-designed and, and ridiculous. Yep. But... This, in terms of casting, in terms of taking a pretty wacky comic book, a lot of the time it's pretty over the top, it's pretty, and yet setting it in a realistic milieu, it still retained everything I loved about Judge Dredd, because I loved the Judge Dredd sure. comics, the early ones especially, uh, and, and translated it into something that's completely believable, a believable, as everyone's fond of hearing me say, there's some verisimilitude in this movie that I really right. appreciate. And it's fantastic. I, I love would, everything about it. I would love to see in the TV series not only Carl Urban, but the, the gal who portrayed Judge Anderson. Yeah. I want to see her return, too. Number four, we've got The Crow. Released in 1994, it's remembered mostly for Brandon Lee's tragic onset death eight days before production was over, almost over. Um, it's listed as number 468 on their top 2008, two, top 500 films. I absolutely love this film. I think uh, it's an incredible movie. Uh, you know, let me throw to you guys first. What are your thoughts on The Crow? I think this film, it's a beautiful movie because, again, it's incredibly stylized. To me, I've always thought of it as the Blade Runner of comic book adaptations. It's a great way to say it. I, I, I love the stylization of it. I love the score. I mean, you're, you're dealing with 90s alternative rock. It's got one of the great Cure songs of all time, oh, yeah. Burn. You know, there's some great... Everything about this film... It Can't Rain All the Time, the Graham Revel score, the performances of all the actors. You've got Michael Wincott as the villain. Yeah. Every movie needs more Michael Wincott, everyone. More Michael Wincott. This, yeah. I can't say enough good things now, about Now, this is one of, the, uh, one of Alex Preuss's best films. I put this and Dark City right up side by side. Alex Preuss is like, a lot of people like to rip on the guy. He's an incredible, incredible filmmaker. auteur filmmaker. Say what you will about his recent films. The Crow stands the test of time. You can watch it right now. I think it's on Netflix. And you can watch it and be like transformed, brought to this other dark goth city and enjoy The Crow. What are your thoughts? Uh, you know, I'm not supposed to, like, I'm, an, I'm not supposed to be embarrassed about movies I haven't seen, but I'm going to make myself a promise. Uh, I will not let another Halloween go by without actually checking this out. Oh, and if I, you, 
Sorry. I never had a goth phase, and it's probably because I didn't see The Crow. If you watch it, watch it on a great surround sound system and play it loud. Because the score and the musical choices, everything about it is great. And you know what? This is kind of the stairway to heaven of goth movies. Yes. Let me go to number three, which is the one that kind of moves Scott Pilgrim out of the top ten. <laughs> it's Heavy Metal, released in 1981, featuring the voice of SCTV comedy legends John Candy, Eugene Levy, Joe Flaherty, and Harold Ramis. Ivan Reitman co-produced this. It's based on a lot of different stories that were all published in the Heavy Metal comic book magazine. Robert Rodriguez currently has the rights to make something with this. We don't know what's gonna happen as far as a feature film adaptation or if it's gonna become a series, but you can check out Heavy Metal, the movie. It's got an incredible soundtrack. Speaking of The Crow, which had a lot of cool goth soundtrack, this has got a great Heavy Metal soundtrack, Blue Oyster Cult, you got so many of this, you got Iron Maiden, you got all these different people on this. Robert, Devo. What are your Devo. You see me now, a veteran of a thousand psychic wars. Yes. That's not the Devo song, by the way. What are your thoughts um, on this? I love this movie. Again, there's a cameo appearance by the destroyed Starship Enterprise right? in this <laughs> film, which is amazing. And I love the story uh, B-17 Bomber. Mm -hmm. You know, it was going to be adapted as a movie called Gremlins at one point. I, th this movie is so much fun. But again, you know, it's a little kind of teenage boy. It really kind of is. I mean, the whole it ends with Tarna, the scantily clad... Dragon, it's got oh, the yeah. Daenerys Targaryen of her age, you know, and uh, it's very interesting. But Amy? I love the film. What do you think? Am I gonna like it? Oh, you haven't seen it? I haven't. Uh, you are probably gonna sort of like it. I mean, <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a product of its time. You have to watch yeah. it with the 1981 filter so, on. Should I double feature this with Fritz the Cat? Uh. Ah, oh, that's interesting. Interesting double feature. Maybe, 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 Just maybe do the not. 70s and then the 80s and then... This would yeah. be a good double feature with Weird Science. If okay. you haven't seen Weird Science, I would say those go hand in hand. Yeah. Let's get into our top two. Number two for me, Ghost World. We had mentioned it a little bit earlier, released in 2001. Screenplay was nominated for the 2002 Academy Awards for Best Adopt Adapted Screenplay by T Terry Zwigoff, an original comic book creator, Daniel Klaus. Overall, 28 different awards that year, 92% on Rotten Tomatoes. It's one of my favorite go-to films. I absolutely love this movie. It is such a fun, you know, basically a w watching these two gals grow up in this small town, dealing with the character of Steve Buscemi, all these, are, I mean, a young Scarlett Johansson, so much amazing stuff in Ghost World. If you haven't seen Ghost World, I don't know why you haven't seen it yet. You should have seen this movie. Get on that right away. See that movie. Robert, thoughts on Ghost World? Again, I, I love this film. I mean, I love the casting. I love the deadpan nature of the movie. It's a fantastic adaptation of the, of the source material, again, which is what I, what I, it's sort of my go-to. Is the source material done right by the film? Have the filmmakers captured what, and they absolutely have, even the music, the way this movie opens with that weird Bollywood dance oh, yeah. clip <laughs> from like 1965 or something. I mean, everything about this movie is so weird and quirky and fun. And it's, it's again, but it's not, it's not for everyone. Nothing blows up. There's no real histrionics. It's just kind of this quiet slice Wait, of life. Don't apologize for an incredibly well-made movie. It's, so good. It is, for anybody who loves comic books, anybody who's like half human, watch this movie because Thora Birch and Scarlett Johansson are the two girls that every nerd wishes they knew when they were like in high school. You got to see this movie, Amy. But more importantly, like they are, they're, they're, Thora Birch, especially her character is us where you're like, yes. you just want someone to get you. Yes. Right. I, like, and, and it, I mean, I was never as cool as either of them. So in that sense, like it's, it's aspirational in that way, but like a quiet movie is hard to make. Uh, to make one that just gets your heart like the way this movie does. It's it's really, it, the cast is exquisite. Uh, it, it's so much fun. And Criterion put out an incredible Blu-ray recently. So if you haven't seen the movie, get the Criterion Blu-ray. I highly recommend it. Excellent. We've got our number one pick, uh, Sin City. It's released in 2005, 158 million at the box office. One of the first movies shot on a digital backlot, completely green screened. Only three sets were practical. Robert Rodriguez resigned from the DGA so that he could co-direct it with Frank Miller. Um, I absolutely adore the original Sin City series. I read it issue by issue in the Dark Horse Presents when it was like four pages at a time. I was like, I want more. And then it finally became a limited series. Absolutely love this gritty noir comic book that Frank Miller was just unrepentant about. He's like, look, I did Daredevil, I did Batman. Now I'm just gonna make these detective stories done in this graphic style. And then to see this graphic style brought to life by Robert Rodriguez and his technologies is just literally amazing. It is a frame by frame, compositionally set tone, 
it's like a tome to Frank Miller. And Frank Miller's involved completely in making it. They were like pulling scenes right out of his comic book. I absolutely adore the first Sin City. And you know what I like even more? You're gonna have to find it. You're gonna have to search it out. It is the Sin City recut version where each of the stories is told like as a little hour long segment. It's not intercut. So you get each of the stories. It's a special release. It's only available on DVD. They should have put it on Blu-ray. They didn't. It's the individual recut story. So you get all of Marv's story. You get all of the three different stories as standalone, the big fat kill. Fantastic. Can't say any more about it. Amy, what are your thoughts about Sin City? I loved this movie. Uh, I And it, it, like, I think, you know, <laughs> it's got an amazing cast. Uh, like, it, it is funny because it's sort of like, it's, it's, it's a borderline waste of a bunch of amazing actresses, but like the 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 movie and it's like the dude parts in the movie are really great, uh, and and like the visuals in the movie are really great, and it deserves to be on this list for the same reasons that Scott Pilgrim is on the top of mine, which is sort of this like how do you tackle an impossible challenge of taking a piece of art which is very stylized and transitioning it to another medium without losing the thing that makes it special, uh, and like this movie's a, just a spectacular success in that area, like it, and it's so memorable, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I love it. What do you think? I'm not as high on this film as the two of you. I mean, I, I appreciate what they've done, but to me, is this an adaptation or a recreation? And they've kind of, I have the same problem with a lot of the Watchmen, right. where it's a slavish recreation of the comic book and it's not necessarily an adaptation into film. Mm. However, that said, what was done here is I think a spectacular achievement they, because they didn't choose to adapt it. They choose. They chose to recreate it in, in a cinema format. I love the casting. I love Mickey Rourke in this movie. He's yeah. great. But it, it it's weird to me. I, don't, I, I see it as something different than an adaptation. But I love it. I think it's a great adaptation. I mean, for me, it's like one of the best comic book to screen adaptations. But hey, you know what? I wanted to correct myself. Iron Maiden is not in the heavy metal soundtrack. I was thinking of Black Sabbath and you know, they, they've got all a cheap trick. I'd had to look it up because like, wait a minute, I don't think Iron Maiden's in there. So sweaties are already commenting. I, I mean, relax, I just corrected myself, <laughs> get on it. Um, Sammy Hagar's in there too, yeah. calling it heavy metal. But you know what? We've got our list, a whole bunch of any ones that I missed that, you know, the Hellboy, we could argue about that. Maybe that should be in the top two, top three. And I am, I'm going to plug in for Scott Pilgrim because it should have been impossible. When they said they were adapting Scott Pilgrim, we were like, that can never, ever work. And, and it, it did. Works. It's a fantastic film. So let us know what your top 10 non-superhero movies are. List them off. Put them in the comment section and let us know. Thanks for watching. Robert, where can we find you online? Watching Josie and the Pussycats, which never gets enough <gasps> credit Shoot, for being as be good as it is. is. <laughs> you can find me on Twitter at BurnettRM or you can find me on Instagram at RMBurnett or find me on Facebook at Robert Meyer Burnett. And remember, when you find me on Facebook, Send me a message and tell me you're not a Russian hot pot. Josie right? and the pussy cats. Where can we find you, Amy? You can find me on Twitter at Insta and Instagram at EnthusiAmy. And Robert, you are dead right. Josie and the Pussycats should be on this list. Well, you know what? Our next list is going to be all the cartoons that have been turned into movies. That's next week. That's a great idea. Let's have fun with it. I'm John Schnapp. You can find me on Instagram and Twitter. Just at John Schnapp. Next week on Collider Heroes. Bye! Hey, guys. If you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.